Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Personal Trainers Who Care podcast. I'm Vanya, COO and one of the personal trainers at Freeform Fitness. Each episode I interview one of our personal trainers, clients, or health professional to give you concrete tools to help you live your life a little bit better. In today's episode, I interview Risa Mallory, a volunteer with the Women at Heart program. Risa is a retired psychotherapist who, as a result of a recent cardiovascular event, has become passionate about women's heart health advocacy. She believes that knowledge is power and that every person can impact their health through education, conversation, and self-advocacy. So before we get to my conversation with Risa, if you enjoyed this or some of our previous episodes or any of the other content that we've produced so far, Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to help support our channel. It will help us reach more people and be able to create more videos for you. Thanks again, and I hope you enjoy my conversation with Risa. Thank you for joining us, Risa. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us a little bit more about heart disease, specifically about women's heart health, and uh, just to share your story and, and why this is such an important topic to you that you're passionate about. So why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about your own heart story? I will. Thank you very much, Vanya, for hosting me today. Um, we can never shine a spotlight often enough on women's heart health. And so I really appreciate the opportunity uh, for this. So my heart story actually begins in my youth, in my young adulthood, because my mother was diagnosed with coronary artery disease when she was only 51 years old and I was 20. Mm -hmm. She ended up having a coronary artery bypass graft surgery at the very newly opened University of Ottawa Heart Institute. She was among one of the first 100 patients oh, wow. to have open heart surgery there. And uh, she did quite well after that initial surgery. Uh, she had to go back in, technology was different then and so on, and she had some lifestyle risk factors. She went back in for a second bypass, bypass eight years later, uh, from which unfortunately she did not survive. So she died quite young at 59 from heart disease. Um, her premature death made it really quite evident to me that I was predis predisposed for heart disease. And so I really began at that young age to take to heart, um, no pun intended, heart healthy approaches to life. Um, I had always been fit and ate well, but I began to exercise with my heart health in mind. I began to uh, choose my, my diet, my food with heart health in mind. And I started to, I quit smoking and I started to be a little bit more mindful about my stress management. But despite all my best efforts, um, I was diagnosed with high blood pressure and high cholesterol at the age of 45, and I've been medicated for those two things ever since. So back in November of 2018, uh, when I was spending the winter in Arizona, I began to feel chest pain. And I wasn't surprised, actually. I thought, okay, I've outlived my mother. Um, angina has caught up to me. On the fourth day of pain, and this is where I kind of insert do as I say, not as I do. Uh -huh. On the fourth day of pain, I um, it changed. I was on the golf course and the pain was worse. It didn't go away as quickly as it had the previous days. It was accompanied by uh, nausea and this sense of fight or flight. Like I had to go somewhere. I didn't know where, I didn't know why, but I remember rocking and just saying to my husband, we've got to go, we've got to go. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up going to the um, nearest uh, emergency department. There was a standalone department in Phoenix, Arizona. And because of my history, I mean, that's a silver lining because my mother did die prematurely. So because of my family history, my symptoms, they did uh, triage me right away. So I had an ECG, which is what everybody should ask for. If they think they have a heart attack, you should ask for an ECG. You should ask for uh, blood being drawn because they test for a enzyme in your blood called troponin, which is released by the heart muscle when it's in distress. And you should ask for nitroglycerin. So all of those three things happened. The ECG looked abnormal. The nitroglycerin abated my pain. And the troponin three hours later was elevated. So I was uh, brought into the uh, catheterization lab uh, right away. Mm -hmm. And they performed an angiogram to see the functioning of the arteries. All it does is look at kind of the plumbing, the arteries of the heart. And I've been told in the past that I'm rather lightweight when it comes to anesthetics. And uh, sure enough, I don't remember a thing of the angiogram. Um, the next thing I do remember is being in a deep, deep fog and listening to an, a woman I assumed was a nurse 
yelling at me to stay awake, Risa, don't fall asleep, stay awake, keep breathing. And um, I looked up at the, I finally opened up my eyes I, and I looked up at the clock and I realized that it was the next morning and I was on an intubator. So I had been put into a um, medical coma while um, they tried to save my life. And as I began to learn more and more information about what happened to me, what is supposed to be about a 45 minute diagnostic uh, procedure turned out for me to be a five hours of life-saving events. Um, shortly after the angiogram started, they noticed a small tear in the left anterior descending artery, which is the main artery that runs down the top of the left side of the heart. And as they pushed some of the contrast dye through the catheter into the coronary arteries, that small lesion, that small tear uh, propagated or reached up all the way up the LAD into the left main artery and over to the circumflex, which runs around the left side of my heart. And it effectively closed all three arteries to the point where I had no blood flow to the left side of my heart. And that situation continued for uh, uh, an hour and a half until they were able to revascularize my arteries with stents. What I learned is that it was not caused by cholesterol or plaque, sticky plaque buildup in my arteries. It was caused by spontaneous coronary artery dissection or SCAD, which is a dissection of the arteries, typically in the lining of the arteries, which allows blood to then flow and create a hematoma as opposed to the blood flowing through the main artery or the lumen, the main opening. It runs in between the linings of the, of the artery and creates this big bulge of blood. And if it gets big enough, it closes the artery from the outside in as opposed to cholesterol that kind of blocks it from the inside out. So I had never heard about SCAD. Um, my cardiologist in the States had never heard about SCAD. Oh, really? Um, yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's becoming more and more well known now, but it's been misdiagnosed a lot in the past. And uh, more and more awareness is being raised about it and more research is being done about it now. But it has very low incidence rate. And one of the things that's interesting about SCAD, as well as other coronary artery diseases, which maybe I should mention now, is that there's a high, high prevalence of certain cardiovascular diseases that happen mostly to women. And SCAD is one of them. So uh, it's about 90% a female uh, heart condition. I was in hospital in the CCU for three days, um, up on the ward floor for eight, and then not cleared to fly home to Ottawa until about five, six weeks later. Unfortunately, I was hospitalized again to the University of Ottawa Heart Institute, and I stayed there for 12 days uh, while we tried to figure out why I was still in a uh, terrible chest pain. But the, the silver lining to that is that during that time, uh, I was in quarantine because I'd come in from another country right into the hospital. Yeah. And so I was uh, in quarantine. I didn't have a lot of visitors except for health healthcare professionals and the cleaners and my spouse who was allowed in and my daughters who were allowed in. Yeah. But it gave me time to really research. I started to really, I had, I had more wherewithal now. Um, I was in a fog for a very, very long time. I couldn't read a sentence, let alone a book for probably six months. But during this time, I started to research in, in uh, snatches about my condition, SCAD, but also about women's heart disease and health in general. And I was alarmed, actually, by mm -hmm. not only the statistics around women and heart disease, heart attacks, but also about the multiple gaps that exist in women's heart health information, both with lay people, women and their families, and with healthcare professionals, even cardiologists. And that was so alarming to me that I started to wonder how I could personally bridge that gap, how I could personally find out more, because to me, knowledge really is power. I'm not the kind of person who will just let things happen to me. I need to understand what's going on. And so one of the things I came across in my research, one of the very first things was um, a peer support program run out of the Canadian Women's Heart Health Centre. It's available to every woman with heart disease in Canada for free. And it is a 10 week peer support program that is a combination of education and support and resources and camaraderie. So it's a, it was a wonderful experience for me. I'm typically not a joiner of things, yeah. uh, but it was wonderful. And after I graduated from that program, I was asked to become a facilitator. And so I, I facilitate still to this day, I facilitate the Women at Heart to Peer program, uh, specifically for the SCAD patients. Mm -hmm. And that kind of opened the door to my volunteer work. I've been retired for 
15 years now. And so I had always been looking for to, to add more meaning into my life. Um, and so careful what you wish for, because now I've got this condition that's prompted me to start advocating. But I do a lot of volunteer work, and it has been actually in, integral to my recovery. Uh, that's kind of my story. You know, although um, a lot of us SCAD patients have a sense of camaraderie and communion because we have the same diagnosis, not only is our physical health story, physical SCAD story, so, so different for each one of us, but we're, we all come to it with different experiences and we each have our own physical strengths and weaknesses. We may have the concurrent uh, physical ailments. We may have mental health issues we're dealing with. We mm-hmm. may have socioeconomic burdens that we're dealing with. Um, we may, you know, have risk factors, one that, that another doesn't have on different medications. So, you know, it's hard to compare yourself to anybody else and you really shouldn't because everybody's experience is so unique. Mm-hmm, for sure. That's a, that's an amazing story, Risa. Thank you for sharing. But yeah, <laughs> it sounds like Thank you. quite the ordeal that you had to go through. What's different about SCAD is that you don't have any warning. People with uh, atherosclerotic disease have some warning. They, they get pain, they have angina, they have shortness of breath, they have dizziness, but with SCAD, it all happens very, very quickly. And, mm-hmm. um, our symptoms for SCAD, some of them are shared with other uh, cardiovascular diseases. Some of them are shared with men. But the symptoms and signs that women experience when it comes to heart disease or heart attack uh, can be quite different. And so I think what's important to realize is that women are not small men. You know, our hearts are smaller than men's. Our hearts beat faster than men's. Our coronary arteries are smaller than men's. We collect uh, cholesterol or sticky plaque differently than men. And women have hormonal fluctuations throughout their entire lifespan that men don't have. And this unfortunately does affect heart disease. Can you talk a little bit more about that? How how do our, our hormonal fluctuations affect heart disease? So uh, thank you. It, it really is very much a lifespan kind of thing. So once a woman starts menarche or has her first menstrual cycle, which varies. I mean, I was little and tiny and I was almost 16, but some girls, you know, start to menstruate when they're 12 or younger even now. So once you're menstruating, um, your estrogen levels are quite strong in our bodies. That's part of the reproductive system. That's what they do. One of the um, uh, added bonuses of uh, estrogen in our bodies is that it also helps to uh, control, modify cholesterol in our bodies. So throughout your lifespan, until you hit menopause, you are actually protected a little bit extra with the estrogen that's in your bodies. And so that's a good thing. Um, However, during adolescence, a lot of teenage girls realize that maybe they aren't menstruating. And there are two diseases that are common to young women, adolescents and young 20-year-old women, that does predispose them for heart disease later in life. One is called polycystic ovary syndrome, where the ovaries uh, don't produce viable eggs. They have these little gel sacs, and they're they're never um, uh, put into the fallopian tube into the uterus to get fertilized, and so you never menstruate. Uh, you don't menstruate. You might have more progesterone than you're supposed to. There might be some... Uh, hair in areas that aren't supposed to be there. Uh, But that condition does predispose women later in life to heart disease. The other one is called primary ovarian insufficiency. And it's a similar hormonal disease that affects young women and predisposes them to heart disease later in life. So that's something to keep in mind about uh, adolescence and early adulthood. When um, a woman becomes pregnant, pregnancy has been uh, compared to a nine month cardiac stress test <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> because you are carrying extra weight, your blood volume is um, higher, you're stressed, um, you're wondering what's going to happen to your life, to your family, to your time for yourself and all of those kinds of things. And But there are some risk factors when it comes to pregnancy. So if you suffer from uh, gestational diabetes, so diabetes during your pregnancy, that puts you at a higher risk for heart disease later in life. If you have uh, preeclampsia, which is high blood pressure during your pregnancy, that also puts you, unfortunately, a little bit higher risk for heart disease later on in life. If you deliver prematurely, so before 37 weeks gestation, 
that also puts you at higher risk for heart disease later in life. So those are some things that uh, pregnant women or women uh, considering pregnancy, you know, want to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Uh, So those are the reproductive years. Then we get to menopause. So uh, menopause is not fun. Not only are they all, are there all of these really uncomfortable, nasty symptoms uh, that come with estrogen just kind of dropping out of your body almost totally. But remember what I said about estrogen having a protective effect on cholesterol in our bodies. Once your estrogen is depleted in menopause, thereby goes the protective aspect that it had before. So although men are typically diagnosed earlier than women for heart disease, by the time a woman reaches the age of 65, her risk is exactly the same as Mm -hmm. men, partly because of aging and other risk factors, but a lot of because of the depletion of estrogen in her body. Uh, It's something that men don't have to deal with. What the, The other aspect, though, of hormones and women is that one of the things, one of the gaps that I was became aware of with women's heart health and disease is that women are under-researched when it comes to cardiovascular diseases. And the, the reason for that is partly because of hormones. So despite the fact that women make up more than half the population of the world, uh, two-thirds of cardiac research is done on white middle-aged men. Mm-hmm. And that's a problem because if all of the research is done on men, then all of the protocols that first responders, triage people, cardiologists, primary care physicians, everybody base their diagnosis and treatment on those protocols that don't apply to us because we're not white middle-aged men. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem. Adding on to the research aspect, you know, it's it's the same when researching drugs as well and medication, right? If a lot of that is being tested on white middle-aged men as well, you know, it's it's going to be totally different how it affects uh, women potentially or any any other uh, demographic. That's very true. Um, so that was one of the the startling kind of gaps um, that I realized when I started to do my research about women's heart health was that we are totally under-researched. Where do we go from there? Like, how how do we change this, Risa? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are some moves afoot. Uh, I'm actually attending a uh, focus group on Friday that is looking, I don't know if I can even say this, but they're looking at developing a Canadian heart health registry, mm. which is wanting to encourage Uh, equal amount of men and women to uh, become involved in this registry. So it's, it would be, it's kind of a passive research project in the sense that you would answer a bunch of questions and your, all of that information would be put into a database and then they would analyze, it would be studied. But I have participated in a number of research projects and I came across them. I I looked because it's important to me. I understood the the gap and the necessity to contribute to fill that gap. So I looked on the University of Ottawa Heart Institute and there are tabs that uh, talk about the research projects going on currently. There's a lot of research going on. A lot of it is um, medical research. A lot of it may not pertain to uh, women, may not pertain, but having said that, even All randomized controlled trials require both a study group and a placebo group. Mm -hmm. So the study group would be people with heart disease, uh, filling the criteria that that particular research project is looking for. And the uh, placebo group would be matched in terms of their demographics, their age, their uh, ethnicity, their socioeconomic, you know, some other health or lifestyle things, but they would not have heart disease. So even if you don't have heart disease and you're listening to this podcast, you could also become involved in research and that would help the cause as well. I'll have to look into that, maybe sign myself up. <laughs> Absolutely. So Risa, why don't you tell me about the rehab? process and and how that went uh, for yourself? Uh, So for me personally, I actually didn't go to rehab. And there's a reason for that. I should have, I wanted to, and I went for an intake interview. But I was, as I mentioned, I was experiencing uh, frequent episodes of severe chest pain. For with SCAD, it's quite common to have chest pain. And I happen to have chest pain daily, Mm. multiple times a day for uh, two and a half years. So when I went for my intake interview for rehab, the intake, uh, 
nurse there did not want to enroll me in the rehab uh, program because of the pain I was in. Um, but I felt, so I was already uh, probably eight weeks out from my SCAD at that point. And because I'd always been healthy and because I knew a lot about stress management and that kind of thing, um, I felt okay. I had mm-hmm. rehabbed, I'd been in Arizona when my SCAD happened. And so when I was discharged, you know, I shuffled half a block to the end of the neighbor's driveway and back the first time and I timed myself and I went a little bit further the time after that and a little bit further uh, with company each time Um, and so my my personal rehab actually went okay okay but what's surprising it's another one of the gaps in women's heart health is that women typically don't go to cardiac rehab despite the the evidence that it is so beneficial to uh, mobility to you know being able to sustain yourself outside of the hospital to longevity and to to future health and women don't go and the reasons for that are there's a, a few of them one is very sadly that they are not referred to cardiac rehab as often as men are by cardiologists and this is a head shaker to me i'm not sure uh, why this is after heart disease Uh, women are 50% less likely to attend cardiac rehab. And that's a very scary stat to me because it is so beneficial to recovery and sustained health. Uh, So one reason is the lack of physician referral. The other reason, uh, as we alluded to before, is women often put themselves last. So Mm -hmm. instead of putting their priorities, their health priorities above other things for an hour or two, they say, well, I, you know, I, I can't take the time off work. I need the money or I'll let somebody down at work or I have to pick up my daughter at hockey or I have to pick up my son at gymnastics or I have to get home to make dinner or, you know, it's my day to go bring dinner to my elderly parents. So there's always somebody else's needs that take priority over the woman's needs. And that is one of the reasons why we don't participate in cardiac rehab. And another one is that there may be some psychosocial or um, physical barriers that prevent a woman from participating. Maybe they live in a remote community. And Mm -hmm. before COVID, virtual rehab was unheard of. Now it's more, but it's still not as effective as person to person. So there's that physical, maybe they don't have a car. Maybe they can't take the time off work. They're a single parent. Um, so there are more barriers that women face than men. And so this unfortunately leads to less women enrolling in cardiovascular uh, rehab programs, card- cardiac rehab pro- programs. And uh, I think the other situation, which is also very sad, but it's really not that dissimilar to most people who set a New Year's resolution to yeah. become more fit and go to the gym and exercise. Again, if that 30-day or 35-day or 40-day habit is not solidified, uh, it's hard to maintain. There are are two different types of motivation when it comes to adopting a lifestyle change like this, intrinsic and extrinsic. So extrinsic is when your doctor says, you either exercise or you're going to have a heart attack. That's extrinsic motivation. And that scares people. That's what a heart attack does initially. It scares people. But after time, uh, you know, a year, 18 months, they go, well, you know, I'm doing okay. I haven't had another heart attack. So I'm going to not go for the walk or the bicycle and I'm going to have that deep fried chicken and french fries and I'm going to um you know let stress get to me and not manage it and I'm going to start smoking again and so we we lose that motivation because it's coming from outside of us mm-hmm. if we have and it, part of a little bit of extrinsic motivation is not a bad thing but I think the most powerful type of motivation is intrinsic where it comes from within uh, and that kind of um, motivation is thinking to yourself I want to be around a long time to see my granddaughter graduate high school. Mm -hmm. To me, that's intrinsic motivation. I want to be able to travel and see the sights of Milan, Italy. I want to enjoy my life and downhill ski. I want to, any other event that comes from internal motivation is very, very powerful. And so that's what I think is needed when it comes to maintaining a lifestyle change. I've I've been doing these healthy lifestyle habits for decades now, and it's not even a choice for me anymore. I just know I don't, I don't, I just don't want to eat a lot of beige deep fried food I look for color I look for crunch I look for variety I do uh, because that's what pleases my palate now Uh, I can't eat a a meal that's been salted I find it abhorrent now and it's 
it's it's not even a, a choice anymore. It's just how how I eat. I don't feel well and healthy when I go more than a couple of days without some kind of exercise. Uh, you've got to find the internal motivation to make a lifestyle change with some of the fear of the extrinsic. Um, in my case, SCAD was not due to plaque buildup or lifestyle choices, except for maybe stress management. And so there's really not anything I can do, which makes SCAD kind of a scary disease because there's not much I can do to control it. Um, but it hasn't stopped me from continuing my healthy lifestyle because we're all going to end up with some amount of cholesterol in our bloodstream. I was diagnosed, as I mentioned, with high blood pressure and cholesterol in, in my mm-hmm. mid 40s. Even my young daughter told me recently that she's got elevated cholesterol levels and she's only 32. Mm-hmm. So most women have at least one risk factor, which has carries a burden with it. So the more risk factors you have, the it's a multiplier effect. It's not a one to one ratio. And so that's kind of another reason why primary prevention is so incredibly important. It's never too early and it's never too late to modify no. your, your <laughs> modifiable risk factors. Yeah, that intrinsic motivation is is huge, right? Because yeah. you know, chasing that dangling carrot only lasts for so long. If it's not coming from within, eventually uh, you know, it gets less appealing to chase after. So figure out what motivates you. It's hard. Yeah. Uh (laughs) Again, it can take a while. Just the other week, one of my clients, she's been working with me for uh, almost two years now. And it was just a couple of weeks ago where after one of our sessions, she goes to me, you know, I I finally can say that I actually look forward to and enjoy coming to my sessions now. And it's been almost two years before she could could get to that point. (laughs) So yeah, definitely yeah. keep going. And the changes can be small and incremental, but those are the changes that last. Yes, right. Um, the idea of a crash diet, you may see results more quickly, but it's not sustainable. No, so it's got to be become part of your lifestyle. Uh, and it, it may be slow and incremental, but you you have to have faith and know that legitimately, you may not be able to see the results externally, mm-hmm. but your body is thanking you, your heart is thanking you, and your lungs are thanking you. I think it's fairly common knowledge that the symptoms of heart disease in women are different from men. Um, I think most people know that it's not the stereotypical, oh, pain in the chest, numbness down the arm and stuff like that. Something that stuck out to me when you were telling your story was that you Mm -hmm. were, you know, you were fairly active. You took care in maintaining your own physical health. You ate well and all that. Yet, you know, yep. you still were struck by by heart disease. Is that also something that's more common amongst women? Well, I think it happens with SCAD. Um, <laughs> SCAD, uh, the average age for a SCAD um, um, patient is around uh, 50, 55 years of age. Mm -hmm. However, there's a huge proportion of young women who suffer a SCAD, and it is connected to the peripartum, postpartum period. So they're in the middle of delivering a baby or up to three months postpartum after delivering their baby. And again, it's a hormonal connection, uh, the researchers think. There's not a lot of definitive causes identified yet for SCAD, but stress is one of them and Mm -hmm. uh, hormonal fluctuation is another. But generally speaking, um, the prevalence of heart disease in younger women is growing, Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's because of lifestyle choices and because of hereditary components. Symptoms are different in women when it comes to heart attacks. So just as you mentioned, most people think about Walter Matthau. If you're an older person, you know who he is. And he, in Hollywood movie, he just kind of clutches his chest and falls to the ground. And that typically doesn't happen for women with a, a heart attack. Among the less common symptoms for heart disease that typically isn't thought about because it doesn't happen often with men. And so I hate to use typical as the word. It's neither typical nor not typical. It's either typical for men or typical for women. So for women, yes, they may get chest pain. They would also maybe get the fatigue that I mentioned and shortness of breath, just as commonly and uncommon to men is that they might have some upper abdominal pain, some nausea, some excessive sweating, uh, trouble sleeping, jaw pain, back or shoulder pain, and even palpitations. So in my uh, Women at Heart peer group, I had a woman who suffered a SCAD and her only symptom was pain right here 
right at the okay. at the tip of her jaw and that's the only pain she had another woman suffered a scad she was bringing groceries up her walkway in the front of her house and she had groceries in front of her like this and she tripped and fell on the groceries and that caused her scad oh, wow. <laughs> so very unusual scad is kind of not the the norm for people to have i think the precedence uh, the prevalence of it now is maybe mm, 20 20 percent of all heart attacks are from scad it's it's maybe they're finding more and more because of of, of awareness but uh, so women's symptoms are quite different from men and one of the other uh, gaps when it comes to women's heart health is that women are under aware even physicians are under aware of these differences but women because we're not aware of all of these other symptoms that are less common less commonly reported when they happen to us, we don't respond. We think, oh, you know, I ate something bad. I've got indigestion or I've got GERD or, you know, I've got that meeting in the morning and uh, I'm nervous about it. And that's all that is. Or, you know, the kids were acting up and I'm just stressed about that. And so we'll slough it off as something other than heart disease because we don't recognize those symptoms. Mm -hmm. The same happens in triage. And unfortunately, same happens with cardiologists. Um, and so that's a, that's a bit of an issue. The other thing is when women do find themselves presented at the emergency department, they'll often describe, or even to triage or to their husband, they'll describe the symptoms differently than men do. They use softer language. I don't know why we do that, right. but we use much softer language. So instead of saying, I've got chest pain, I'm having a heart attack, they'll say, well, I've got, I've got some heaviness here. You know, mm -hmm. maybe it was something I ate. So Again, not sure why that happens. Um, I think part of the research suggests that it's because we don't want to make a fuss. We don't want to look like we're hysterical because often sometimes we get labeled like that, like we're overreacting and it's not that bad and, you know, suck it up and that kind of thing. And so we don't want to fit into that mold. And so we, we push kind of the idea that something real is happening away. Uh, but we, sh we shouldn't. I mean, cardiologists will say that time is muscle, meaning that the longer you wait, if you're having a heart attack, the more muscle loss uh, mm -hmm. you'll have. Uh, in the 45 minutes that I had no blood flow to my left ventricle, I lost 25% muscle. So, yeah. and I, that won't get better. It won't, it won't rejuvenate it. it you know, I'm going to be, my life is great. And I have very few, uh, huge uh, ramifications from my event but I get tired easily and I can't mm -hmm. walk upstairs without losing uh, my breath and so you don't want that to happen you want to act right away and that means calling 911 ideally uh, secondarily have somebody bring you to the emergency department but not as good an option and lastly drive yourself which is the worst possible option mm -hmm. So, and then ask for those um, three things to be done when you get there. The other thing I really think is important to mention, and this is goes to primary prevention. So primary prevention of cardiovascular disease can pr prevent up to 33% of heart attacks. And that means acting before you have an event, putting things into place with lifestyle adjustments and modifications that help you to avoid having a heart attack in the first place. And one of the things that I talk about, I also deliver these community advocacy uh, presentations to groups. And one of the things I stress is that even if you don't have any, and by the way, most people by the age of 20, most women by the age of 20 have at least one risk factor. Mm -hmm. So people don't know that, but it's it's a stat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it wow. is a statistic. Um, so what I recommend everybody do uh, is that you find a cardiovascular risk assessment tool. The University of Ottawa has one of theirs online. You can use that one, but there's others online that you can look at. And what that does is it, in conjunction again with your partnership with your healthcare provider, in this case, probably your primary care uh, provider, you go to them with a printed version of a coronary, uh, coronary uh, cardiovascular risk assessment tool. And some of that you will fill in, which will be demographic things like your age, your sex, your ethnicity, your weight, your waist circumference, they'll ask for, things like that. Uh, any history of cardiovascular disease in your family, because one of the risk factors is genetic risk factors. And then with your physician, you bring this to them, they will uh, order some blood work for you. And with that blood work, they should be looking at your cholesterol levels, both HDL and LDL. Um, 
because it's a combination of those that creates your, you want the HDL to be high and the LDL to be low. And the combination is the number that you're looking for in a healthy range. They should look at uh, blood glucose, sh um, blood sugar levels for diabetes or pre-diabetic conditions. They should look for triglyceride as well levels. And all of those things you can have done. If you don't have any symptoms, you get that done, it becomes your baseline. So you know where you stand. And then you can go back and say five years, do the cardiovascular risk assessment again, compare your numbers, find out where you stand. If some of the um, information, the numbers and the data come back and it puts you in a abnormal range at the high end of the scale, oh, blood pressure would be another thing for sure, mm -hmm. uh, blood pressure readings. Um, and if your numbers come out abnormal on the high end of the scale, then that tells you this is a personalized risk assessment. It tells you, okay, these are some things, these are warning flags, these are things I need to pay attention to. So in conjunction with your primary care physician, you say, okay, this was an abnormal number. My blood pressure is high, what do we need to do? My cholesterol levels are borderline, what should I do? And talk to them about the options that are available to you because it's not always just medication right away. There may be some lifestyle things you can do. 80% of our risk factors are modifiable by our lifestyle. Weight, uh, blood pressure, cholesterol, smoking, those are all modifiable risk factors. So for instance, if your physician comes back with this um, uh, cardiovascular risk assessment profile and says, yeah, you know, your, your, blood, your cholesterol levels are high. And you say, okay, so are, is my LDL too high or is my HDL too low? Like do some research, know what you're talking about because LDL is modified by our diet. The mm -hmm. other way you can affect cholesterol is by increasing your exercise because HDL, which is the number you want to be higher, can be increased with exercise. So exercise is a multifaceted lifestyle um, component that we can modify that helps reduce our risk of cardiovascular disease in so many different ways. Yeah. Because not only does it increase our HDL, which helps to combat the LDL and create a nice healthy number, but it it, it modifies, uh, it's a stress management tool. It helps to alleviate any kind of emotional issues you're having. It can be a replacement for drugs and alcohol instead of reaching for a quick fix if you're having a bad day. I mean, that uh, exercise, in, and it doesn't have to be an hour and a half at the gym. It doesn't even have to be a 45-minute walk. It can be 10 or 15-minute increments, increments during the day, mm -hmm. um, as often as you wish, kind of trying to reach, you know, 150, 200 minutes a week. But new research has shown that you don't get more benefits from doing an hour-long push or a jog or a, a cross-country ski than you do from doing 10-minute walks at a moderate pace. But there's, there's lots of ways that we can uh, modify our risk factors on our own. And keeping in mind that, you know, there's like 8,760 8, hours in the week, and we only see our healthcare professionals for, if you're lucky, two, three hours a year. Yeah. Wait, did I say a week? I meant a year. 8,760 hours in a year, I meant to say. And so we see our healthcare professionals for a very short period of time in that. And so really it's incumbent on us as patients to take care of our own bodies mm -hmm. and to do what we can to do them. We, we are the best advocates for our own bodies in terms of not just verbal advocacy, but also advocating with good, good diet and good exercise and uh, good stress management and um, all kinds of things. We know it's not easy, right? Making those lifestyle changes. Um, it does no. take work. It will take time. But like you said, it doesn't have to be this huge commitment right away where you're expected to spend an hour plus at the gym. Uh, walking is completely underrated for all aspects of our health. And yeah, just start with 10 minutes at a time you know, work yourself up to a couple of times Absolutely. a day of that and, uh, you know, just aim to making it more frequently over time as, as you get more comfortable with it, right? I think the goal is really just to be active and whatever activity appeals to you, you're not going to continue something that doesn't appeal to you. No. So pick something that you enjoy and keep track of it because then you'll see progress and that's reinforcing. Um, at the end of a short-term goal, give yourself a little uh, reinforcement of some kind. You know, it takes, a psychologist will tell you that it takes 30 days to make a habit. 
And that habit can be a sedentary habit as well as it can be an activity related habit. And so if you stick to it and it becomes part of your life, then it becomes part of your life. You make you make time for it. You make time and pick one thing. I mean, activity is very important, but so is some sort of relaxation technique. So is meditation. So is gardening. Whatever appeals to you, pick one small goal at a time. Uh, break it down into smaller bits, as you mentioned. Make the uh, breakdown tangible. Make it doable. Don't make it so difficult that it's onerous and you can't see yourself achieving it. And keep track. And at the end of a, of a preset short-term goal, maybe a week, if you've gone, if your goal was to exercise five days that week and it was 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes after work and you did that, give yourself a great big check mark and maybe some sort of a reward. Uh, mm -hmm. That might be a new scented candle or a bubble bath or, you know, something for you. Mm -hmm. um, and then continue that goal, maybe make it a little bit more challenging, maybe make the duration a bit longer so that you've got these stepping stones. And before you know it, it's just part of your life now. I don't, I don't think I could ever stop exercising. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm not walking one day, I'm golfing the next day. Find what works for you, what resonates with you. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. No, exactly. In terms of, you know, the, the average 30 days to create a habit, you know, I want people to understand that that is an average. It may take some people longer to, to build it up. And, and that's yes. okay, right? So don't get discouraged. Just keep yeah. at it. And yeah. yeah, just think about those, those little steps and progress over time. Exactly. There's a, there's a whole cycle of uh, that psychologists talk about with decision making. And when you fall off the wagon, you just dust yourself off. And perhaps you fell off because your goals weren't quite appropriate for you. Either it, they were too hard or not hard enough and you got bored. So just revisit your goals, revisit the activity, make sure it resonates with you and start again. There's a, no shame in that at all. It's mm -hmm. uh, every effort that we make is a positive effort with a foot forward. And uh, yeah, there's no such thing as as failure. You just reset the goal and start again. It's only failure if you stop trying, right? So exactly trying, it, it hasn't ended. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, Risa, any any last words of, of advice or um, anything else that you wanted to, to add in, in terms of women's heart health before we, we end off today? Uh, I think, you know, some of my key messages always are that be proactive with your health. That includes primary prevention, taking care of yourself now before it's never too late, but it's also never too early to mm -hmm. take preventive action with your with your health care. Uh, so be proactive that way with your healthcare. Be proactive with your, um, uh, if you are in healthcare, whenever you see your physicians, be be an active participant in your healthcare. Be able to uh, have a interview, uh, an appointment with them where you come across, where you come away feeling respected and heard. And there are things you can do to maximize the communication between you and your primary care physician or your specialist, whoever that may be, even your dentist for that matter. And that is go in with a list of prepared questions. If, mm -hmm. if you have something on your mind, write the things down that you want to talk to them about. If you have regular, so for a while there, I was seeing my cardiologist on a regular basis. And so I would kind of keep a live document things what I would put on that list and then they either remedied themselves so they weren't an issue, I took them off the list and then I added something else onto the list so that by the time my appointment came along, I had things that were important for me to discuss with her. And uh, if, so some people will say, well, you know, just put the, the top three things on the list and address them first in case you run out of time and that's not me. If I've no. got lots of things on my list to talk to my cardiologist about, I'll actually call the office and say, I'm gonna need an extra 10, 15 minutes mm -hmm. in my appointment. I've got quite a few things going on that I want to address. And so they'll typically accommodate that. So write things down so that you have them in front of you. And because sometimes we get like women, we go, oh no, I'm okay. You know, it's just a little thing. No, it's not really bothering me, but it has been bothering you and it does bother you. And so yeah. write these things down. Um, write down the answers that the cardiologist or specialist or family doctor replies to you. Write things down. Sometimes at, at appointments, they'll let you record them. So if you can, with your iPhone or your uh, your smartphone, uh, mm -hmm. record the appointment that you have. So then you have it verbatim uh, between you and your physician. Uh, sometimes it's helpful to bring somebody with you 
That way you can really focus on what the per the uh, healthcare professional is saying. And the other person can maybe remind you of something else that you wanted to mention, or maybe hear something a different way than you did. And when you leave, you'll be able to compare notes, if you will. Um, don't be afraid to ask for definitions from your healthcare professional. They use jargon just like a hairdresser uses jargon. You know, I'm going to use volume this with this kind of stripper. Like, I don't know what she's talking about, right? Yeah. Um, and cardiologists tend to do the same. They shortcut and they use the jargon that they're familiar with. So I remember when I was an inpatient, um, the cardiologist came in and they, he was talking to me about my angiogram. And he said, you know, by the way, I saw on your angiogram that you have a jailed artery. And then he started, he continued on talking and I'm stuck on this word jailed. I have no idea what he's talking about. I actually thought about the Monopoly board and the square yeah. in the corner that said jail. Like that's what yeah. I'm thinking about. And he's talking about some, and so I said, excuse me, I, you, ha you have to explain to me what you mean by jailed. As it turned out, it's just a, an artery that is a cut off by a stent that was implanted. And so it's no longer functioning because it's been cut off. So don't be afraid to ask for definitions. They're used to this, and that's not even medical terminology. You know, that's just lay language used in a different way, but I had no idea what he was talking about. So don't be afraid to ask for that. Um, don't be afraid to kind of reflect back to them what you've heard in the appointment. Okay, so you want me to take this medication uh, twice a day uh, with food. And so, you know, kind of reverberate back what, what they've said to you. If you're not feeling heard, for me, healthcare is, is a... It, is a consumer service really it is and i actually shopped around for the cardiologist i i went online and there's a website that talks rates your physicians yeah. and it talks about how personable they are how how on time they are how, what their bedside manner is like all those kinds of things and plus this uh, cardiologist happens to be a, a specialist in scad so it was important that i saw her and i i she was actually my third cardiologist i had an inpatient cardiologist and then a first outpatient one and then he referred me to the one i currently have but don't be afraid to do that is my point don't be afraid if you're not feeling heard if you're not feeling listened to if you're not feeling respected then if you can, not everybody, there's not, you know, a plethora of cardiologists or family physicians out there, but if you can find an alternative, um, do that. As as a consumer, we have the right to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, we all make this assumption that the doctors know best, um, they're the experts. But again, like you said, we're the experts on our bodies, right? And yeah, it's up to us to kind of take control of our, our, our health and, you know, get the full understanding, ask the right questions and uh, be as prepared as possible so that uh, you can take your care of yourself as much as possible. That's right. We don't, we don't want to be rude to them. They have, mm -hmm. you know, tons of education that we don't have. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it is an equal partnership, I believe. And so mm -hmm. with respect and uh, mutual respect, I think yeah. the, the research has shown that uh, the outcomes for patients are far better when you work together as a team in your healthcare. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I love that tip that you gave about calling ahead of time, letting them know that, that you mm -hmm. have a long list of questions. So they're prepared. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great, Risa. So thank you so much again for, for joining me today. You're welcome. And sharing your story and uh, sharing more knowledge about you know this important issue and especially during this month as we celebrate heart month and and trying to disseminate as much information and, and knowledge as we can to help as many people as we can well, thank you vanya i really appreciate the opportunity to help uh, shine the spotlight on women's heart health thank you very much